So we're still using this example where we have this molecule and it has a charge. And what we're going to notice is that charge is responsible for kind of the mix of double and single bonds that are on an atom. Okay, and so the question is, how do we determine the charge of an atom in a molecule when electrons that make up the covalent bonds are shared between atoms? And so the best way to do this is to use the rules for formal charge to assign electrons. And the rules are shown here, and, and your book goes through some, but honestly, I really like um, using a formula for this where we have formal charge, equals the valence electrons minus the number of bonds plus the number of lone pair electrons, okay? And so, oop, I said lone pair electrons. I just want you to see lone electrons, okay? And so, so lone electrons. So let's, for example, look at this oxygen right here, okay? Formal charge equals the valence electrons. And so we look at the periodic table and we see oxygen has six valence electrons minus there is one bond that's attached to this oxygen. And then we count the number of lone electrons and there are six, right? And so when we do this math, we see the formal charge is negative one. We can get the formal charge here on this oxygen, which has a different distribution of uh, bonds. And we can say, look, we have six minus four plus two, and that gives us zero. So this, I feel, is a really great way to figure out our formal charges. Um, I want to point out something, which is kind of a nice double check when you're doing formal charges. The sum of the formal charges must equal the total charge on the ion. So if you remember from the last screencast when we did this Lewis structure, this entire molecule had a negative one charge. And we can see the formal charge here is, will if we add them all up, it also equals negative one, which is the overall charge. So there's a great double check for you um, to make sure that your, your formal charges are working or are correct. Now, one of the things that you've probably already picked up on is that some species aren't described well by Lewis structures. So, for example, when we did the Lewis structure of this, I said, hey, look, you could do this Lewis structure, but there's also a second Lewis structure you could do. And so the question, of course, is, well, which one is a better Lewis structure or which one is correct? Um, and we're going to we're gonna dig around in that a little bit more than we did in general chemistry. And to do this, we're going to use a theory called resonance theory. And... Resonance theory just basically says, look, some species aren't described well by Lewis structures because Lewis structures imply that electrons are localized. Now, what localized means is that electrons are shared, right, between just two atoms. So, for example, these electrons between the hydrogen and the carbon here are localized electrons. They're just shared between these two atoms. Now, when we looked at this structure before, I said, look, you can have a Lewis structure that looks like this. And then we drove, uh, drew a two-headed arrow between it. And we said, but if you drew this Lewis structure, that's okay too. These are called resonance hybrids. I'm sorry, resonance contributors. Okay, and this double-headed arrow is on purpose. 
So this is the arrow that you use to show you've got resonance contributors. So that's the one we're going to use there. Now, when we look at this and we see that you can have a double bond here, but you can also have a double bond here. In reality, when we measure bond lengths, we don't see a double bond here and a single bond here. We see a bond that's a little shorter than a single bond and a little longer than a double bond. It's like a bond and a half. And what that indicates to us is what we're really seeing is something called a resonance hybrid. And in a resonance hybrid, what we see are that the electrons here aren't just between this carbon and this oxygen. And they're not just between this carbon and this oxygen. Instead, these electrons are spread out over more than two atoms. So they're shared between this oxygen, this carbon, and this oxygen. This is called a resonance hybrid. This is what we actually have. That's what we actually have in the bottle. These resonance contributors are fictitious. We don't actually have those. Um, but when we use Lewis structures, we'd still use Lewis structures. We just understand that these now have delocalized electrons. Um, and so when electrons are spread out, they are called delocalized. Okay? And, and that's what we see. It, it helps increase stability. So you're going to notice there are a couple types of resonance structures. And you're going to practice drawing resonance structures. And so it's really helpful to identify and figure out when we are going to see resonance structures. So we are, um, so one of the things that's really important is that resonance structures are only differ in their placement of their electrons. Their atoms are never going to move, right? And so we use resonance theory to help us draw good resonance structures. Now, what you're seeing here are the two, exactly what I drew on the last slide, right? Here are your two resonance structures. There's a resonant arrow, resonance arrow. Here are the resonance hybrids, okay? And so, but I want you to be able to recognize when an atom is gonna have resonance structures or when a molecule is gonna have resonance structures. And so the first rule here is that Resonance occurs, so we'll call it rule one. Resonance occurs in species where there are two or more Lewis structures. So we can have two different Lewis structures we are gonna end up with resonance. Sometimes you can have three, four, and five, right? So we can have lots of resonance structures. And we have kind of this rule two for resonance theory um, is that an individual resonance structure doesn't describe or accurately describe the structure of the species. The one true species is better characterized by the resonance hybrid. So the one true species is better characterized by the resonance hybrid, right? And that's basically like a weighted average. So it's a weighted average of all resonance structures. Now, here's rule three. Okay. The resonance hybrid is going to look like the most like 
the lowest energy or most stable resonance contributor. So the resonance structure looks like the lowest energy and what we're going to see in organic chemistry is a lot of times the lowest energy and most stable are synonymous. So if I say something's lowest energy, that means it's the most stable. Higher energy, less stable. And there's not going to be a clear good or bad all the time. So we have to really think every time we see lowest energy, what does it mean? And so for us, it means the resonance structure looks like the lowest energy or the most stable resonance structure. And we have some, some tips for how to pick that out in a second. Okay. Um, one of the things I want you to notice here are these two resonance structures are what we call equivalent. There's not one that contributes more than the other. Okay. Um, and so because these are equivalent, each one contributes equally to the resonance hybrid. And so here's rule four. Resonance provides stabilization. Resonance stabilization is usually really large when resonance structures are equivalent. So this ion is really stable because we have two resonance structures that are equivalent and those electrons are spread out. So if resonance structures are equivalent, they will con contribute equally to the hybrid. So each of these guys contribute equally to this hybrid, allowing the greatest possible delocalization. And all else being equal, the greater number of resonance contribu structures or contributors, the greater the resonance stabilization. So if you have five, you're probably pretty stable. And we're gonna see some molecules like that in a second. Now I love a good analogy. And so we're going to look at a resonance structure analogy next. Um, and the, the one that your book uses, I don't love. So it's here, and I'm just going to, going to mark through it. And I'll tell you why I don't love it in a second. But remember, when we are doing resonance structures, right? And I, I just said, when we look at this resonance structure over here, um, and, I, and I can't go back, but when we look at them, I said, look, the individual resonance contributors are fictitious. They are not found in the bottle, right? And so a really good analogy is resonance contributors like a unicorn and a dragon. They're not really there. Those are fictitious creatures. But a rhino is kind of like a hybrid of those two things, and it actually exists. And so our resonance hybrid actually exists. Okay. Now, I don't love the resonance structure analogy of a duck and an otter because those are real things. And so I don't feel like it's a great analogy. So I love this particular analogy <clears throat> if it helps you. If not, just I apologize for the last minute and six seconds of your life. All right, let's go on to resonance structure stability. How do we figure out um, how things are stable? So this is an example here that the two things in brackets are resonance structures that are not equivalent. Okay, um, and we, we notice they're not equivalent because they've got a charge. One has a charge on a carbon and one has a charge on the oxygen. And so we have to figure out which one is more stable and which one will, the one that's more stable will greater contribute to the resonance hybrid. And so we have some guiding rules for this. So a resonance structure is lower in energy or more stable when you have more atoms with a completed octet. Okay, that's gonna make it more stable. When you have fewer atoms with a non-zero formal charge, Right? And you have a negative charge on an electronegative atom. 
and a pot and or let me put or because it's not always going to happen and or a positive charge on the more electropositive atom. Now, here's the deal, okay? Um, these factors are presented in order of importance. This is the most important here at the top. And you are going to end up with examples or resonance structures that contradict themselves. And so the one that's the most important is at the top. This is the least important. Okay. You're not going to see all of these things in a resonant structure. So you have to evaluate each of these things. And if there's a contradiction, then you go with the, the one that's the most important. And so I want us to look at an example where there's a contradiction. And it's this example right here. Okay. So I am going to start... With this example, I'm, I'm going to try to figure out which of these two resonance structures makes a greater contribution to the resonance hybrid, okay? Is it this one or this one? Which one's more stable? Which one's going to contribute more? So the first question I ask myself is, which resonance structure has more atoms with a complete octet, okay? That means, right, I mean, we don't worry about hydrogens because they've all got one bond. I look at this carbon here and I say it's got four bonds. It has a complete octet. I look at this carbon here. It only has three bonds. It's got a positive charge. It has an incomplete octet. This oxygen here has a complete octet and this carbon has a complete octet. I look over here. This carbon has four bonds. It's got a complete octet. This carbon has four bonds. It's got a complete octet. This oxygen has two, four, six, eight. So it has a complete octet, and this carbon has a complete octet. All of these have a complete octet. All the atoms here have a complete octet. This one, carbon doesn't have a complete octet. So that indicates to us off the bat that this is going to be the one that's the most stable. Okay. Now, let's just evaluate. It says the fewer atoms with a non-zero formal charge. So which resonance structure has fewer atoms with a non-zero formal charge? Neither of them do. This one has a formal charge of plus one. That one's got a formal charge of plus one. So this doesn't apply to this resonance structure. So we're just going to ignore it. And then we're going to ask ourselves, does it have a negative charge? And is that negative charge on the most electronegative atom? And that, question, that answer is no. And then if we've got a positive charge, is it on the more electropositive atom? Well, let's look at this. Carbon and oxygen are the two that we're comparing. We know, based on that trend in electronegativity, oxygen's more electronegative. This is more electropositive. So there's a contradiction here because the positive charge here is on the more electro positive atom. And so this is an example where the rules contradict themselves. And so that's where we go in order of importance. More atoms with a complete octet is more important. And so that tells us that this is the contributes more to the hybrid, the resonance hybrid. So you can use these rules to figure out which one contributes more to the resonance hybrid. Now, Resonance helps us um, predict reactivity because delocalization of these electrons results in lower energy and greater stability. And so we can see that there's an image here that's really helpful if you're a visual learner, but I'm going to fill in the sentence. Resonance structures are stabilized as a result of the delocalization of electrons because electrons have lower energy when they are less confined. Now, delocalization is lower in energy than the localization of electrons. And so every so often in here, you're going to see some energy diagrams where energy increases this way. And I want you to notice we've got a resonance structure here where it's showing a, a localized electrons and a resonance structure here that are showing localized electrons. But in reality, what we see is the resonance hybrid is going to have less energy 
because we have electrons that are delocalized over several bonding regions, right? So delocalization results in lower energy and greater stability of a complex. So as I mentioned before, we can have equivalent resonance structures. We can see an example of equivalent resonance structures here. Um, a species that has equivalent resonance structures tend to be a lot more stabilized. Um, so this is an example of the molecule benzene. Benzene has alternating double bonds. Um, when we measure benzene, what we find is all six of those carbon-carbon bonds uh, have the same bond length. Um, and it's between a double bond and a single bond. And so we know that those electrons are delocalized over the different carbon atoms. So as the number of resonance structures increases, um, the species tend to be more stable. The benzene here is equivalent. They contribute equally. Um, benzene is particularly stable. Um, and like all good scientists, we always love to cut corners. And so benzene sometimes is just shown with a circle inside. Just So I just love to, I like to point that out. Um, benzene is an interesting molecule. Uh, it's an aromatic hydrocarbon that is naturally found in crude oil. Um, and it's got a really high octane number, which is really, so it's an important, uh, it's an important component of gasoline. So benzene is really commonly found in gasoline. Now, as I've already pointed out, we can have non-equivalent resonance structures. This is an example of a non-equivalent resonance structure. It's acetic acid. Um, and it is not stabilized by resonance. I'm going to say not greatly stabilized. All right. Although it's got two resonance structures, only the one on the left, this one, contributes significantly. The one that we have on the right here um, is a lot higher in energy because we have two charges present. So notice this is a case where all the octets are met here and all the octets are met here. But now, so we, we, we grew, that first kind of rule doesn't apply right? But when we look at the one that has more, um, if we look at the one that has more charges here, that's going to lead us to, to, to indicate that this doesn't contribute as much because the uncharged is more stable. So the electrons here aren't very highly localized. So let's focus on how we draw resonance structures. So we've We've, we've defined resonance structures. We've come up with a strategy to evaluate which resonance structure contributes more to a resonance hybrid. And now we're going to settle down and we're going to learn to draw resonance structures. So when you draw resonance structures, and it's really important to be able to draw resonance structures to figure out which species is reacting. Um, all resonance structures contribute to the features of the resonance hybrid. And the total number of resonance structures, remember, is related to the species stability. And so these two things are, are helpful to keep in mind. Now, what you're going to notice here is we are using curved arrows. So when we start, we're going to say any two resonance structures differ only where the electrons are located. The atoms remain frozen in place. Do not move your atoms. Leave the atoms there, okay? And we're going to represent the movement of electrons by using curved arrows. So a few things that are important here. We're going to use curved arrows a lot. Um, so the curved arrow represents valence electrons. And that movement of valence electrons. So that's really important. This curved arrow originates from a lone pair of electrons or from the center of a double or 
triple bond. This is important where you draw it. It's very important. Don't do weird things. We're, we're drawing <clears throat> two places, from an electron or the very center of a double or triple bond. We'll practice this in class, but you will get points off if you start this arrow in some wickety wild place. Don't do that. All right. The arrow points to an atom if the electrons being moved become a lone pair. Otherwise, that arrow is going to point to the center of an existing single or double bond to represent the formation of a new double or triple bond. Okay. Otherwise. The arrow points to the center of an existing single or double bond to form a new double or triple bond, okay? So let's look at this. These electrons, so, so you have, <clears throat> with organic chemistry, you have to have a vivid imagination. So, so, so dig deep, we're gonna have vivid imaginations, and we know what this means, is that these electrons are, are gonna move here and form a double bond right here. And that's where that double bond is right there. They just swap over, boop right there, okay? And then those electrons, when they flop over here, remember carbon can't have more than five bonds, and so it kind of like forces these electrons up here, boop. And now we have six electrons up here. I want you to notice the charge changes. So you need to reevaluate your formal charges when you, when you do this. So let's look at some features that can help us identify resonant structures. So, there are five key features that suggest that another resonant structure exists, okay? Um, because you're not always going to have both of them there, right? So, you're going to have to recognize, duh, is there another resonant structure for this? Um, so, when we look at number one here, the first feature, we're going to see that a lone pair of electrons on an atom is adjacent to a multiple bond. So what that means is that we have an atom with a lone pair right here next to an atom with a double bond. And so we've already talked about we can use this to convert this to a double bond here and a single bond there. Okay. Um, I want you to notice again, the formal charges, as we look through this, on some of these atoms are going to change from one resonant structure to the another. And so you can recalculate formal charges on each atom after you draw a resonant structure, but you can also kind of uh, work with some patterns here. So notice um, when this lone pair is converted to a bonding pair, the formal charge becomes more positive by one. So it was negative here, all of a sudden it's a bonding pair, boom, that's now a neutral. So, so we've done that. When the reverse happens, um, the formal charge on the atom becomes more negative by one. So look, this is a double bond, it goes up here, this was had no formal charge, now it has a negative one. Okay, and so, so that's a pattern that you can use and really recognize. Now let's come here and look at feature two. In feature two, we have an, in, an atom lacking an octet is adjacent to a mul mul uh, multiple bond, okay? So notice that this carbon here is lacking an octet. It just has two, four, six electrons around this carbon. And then this, it's, 
this guy is next to a carbon with a double bond. So notice these electrons can move towards the carbon lacking an octet. And this should make sense because electrons are negative and this is positive and it can flop over here. Now, again, look at the trend of formal charges. When an atom is initially lacking an octet and it gains an octet, the formal charge becomes more negative by one, right? So it was plus here and now it's neutral. Notice that, that when the opposite happens, right? We had an octet and now we don't have an octet. Um, we're gonna become more positive, okay? Let's look at the third feature. So the third feature is if you've got a lone pair of electrons on an atom and it's adjacent to an atom with an incomplete octet, you're going to have a resonance structure. And so look, if you've got an incomplete octet here and you've got lone pairs, those lone pairs can flop down here and you can now have molecules with two octets, right? Now, and there's still a charge. This one, this one is going to be much more stable. Right, but we've got a lacking octet here and lone pairs here. So these are three really good ways to um, recognize when a molecule is gonna have resonant structures. Now, I wanna make a really quick note for you to avoid drawing two curved arrows pointing toward the same atom or pointing away from the same atom. So notice only, only at one, one arrow, right? One, each atom only has one arrow. So make sure, you know, don't, don't do wickety wild things with your arrows. And we're going to practice this a lot. Now, there are two other features. Um, so the, the two other features are polar multiple bonds. And so um, what we're talking about here, and, and I, don't, I don't love this. I don't really feel like it's a true resonance structure. Um, but that's what your book defines it as. And there's a lot of people who talk in... Um, kind of organic chemistry circles about whether this is really resonant structure or not. And we're, we're going to go ahead and treat it like this. But basically, look, you can have these electrons come up on this atom. I argue that this is not a resonant structure because these electrons aren't shared over more than one, um, more than one, these electrons aren't shared over more than two atoms right? So, but your book is going to define it at that as that, and that's okay. Feature five is a ring of alternating single and double bonds. And we see that ring here, like with benzene. If you have a ring where it goes double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, you have resonance, okay? And so that's something that, that you're going to see there. So my hope is that these Five features will help you recognize resonant structures. So let's practice drawing resonant structures. So frequently a species is gonna have more than two resonant structures. And so we're gonna look at, at this example really, really just first, I've got, got them all drawn here. And I want you to track what's going on. So we have a, a lone pair of electrons next to a double bond. Those lone pair of electrons can come here and form a double bond. Now, once this forms a double bond, notice the formal charge increases by one to go from negative one to zero here. And when we have a double bond here, what we're gonna see now is that these electrons hop up onto this carbon. So now that they're on this carbon, right, you're gonna have a negative formal charge. Notice from here to here, the rest of this molecule, nothing changes, okay? So this is one resonant structure, and this is the second resonant structure. Now, what we see is these electrons come up here, and they're shared between these carbons to form this double bond here, and these electrons flop up there 
to sit right there on that carbon. Notice the formal charge changes. Okay, this is the second resonance structure. Now, I want you to practice drawing the resonance arrows between this species and this species. So you can pause me, draw those structures in, and then start this screencast again. I'm gonna give you a second to do that. Okay, so hopefully you've tried it on your own, right? I want you to notice my arrow is gonna start at the lone pair of electrons, and we're gonna move this way, okay? And when those electrons go there, it's going to form the double bond that we see right here. Now, that carbon can't have five bonds, so those electrons are going to go on that carbon. Okay. Now, if we were to draw the resonance hybrid from these resonance structures, the way you start, or the way I start, is I draw the carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I go ahead and draw my hydrogens in. Because remember, the atoms aren't moving. So you can just come in here and say, great, I'm going to draw in all my hydrogens. Because those atoms aren't changing. All's well. Okay. And then I want you to notice everywhere that you drew electrons moving, you're gonna draw dashed lines because that's gonna show where we have that negative charge. And so I drew a red arrow here, and then these moved here, and then I'm looking at the second one and they went here and here, and then I'm looking at the third one, and we went there, and the fourth one we went here. And look, those electrons are delocalized over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven atoms. We've got four different resonance structures here. That's a very stable molecule, and this is our resonance hybrid. Now, notice I have not done anything with those negative charges. Everywhere, every atom that had a negative charge now has a partial negative charge. Okay, so there was a negative charge on that carbon. There wasn't one on the second carbon. There was one on this carbon. There wasn't one on the fourth one. There was one on this carbon. There wasn't one on the fifth one. And there was one on this carbon here. So you can see now, instead of having a full negative charge, we've spread out that negative charge. Okay, so let's do another example. Draw another resonance structure of the species that's shown here. So we have a species here, and we want to draw a resonance structure. And so here are some of the things we need to think about before we draw a resonance structure. Which feature from figure 132 applies to this species? Now, when I look at this, the first thing, honestly, is I look for a ring that's got alternating double bonds. It doesn't have it, so I can rule out five. Uh, you're really going to kind of ignore four. That's, that's a weird one. So let's go back to one, two, and three. And so you can turn back to your, to your notes from one, two, and three. And what we're going to notice is the first thing my eyes wonder to are charges. Because generally, if you have a charge, that means that there's a high potential that there could be a resonant structure. So my eye wanders here to this charge, right? And so we have a lone pair of electrons here. And that's on a carbon that's adjacent to a carbon with a multiple bond, that carbon-carbon triple bond. And so that really corresponds to feature one. Okay? And so we have one of the features for a resonance structure. Now, the next thing you need to ask yourself is how many curved arrows must be added and how should you draw them? And then you need to figure out what to do with formal charges, okay? So here is, is what I do. Um, I, that second step makes me really nervous. And so what calms me before I jump into this is I go ahead and draw my second, um, my second structure, right? And I know that right here, 
is the only thing that's going to change for this because that's the part of feature one. So I come up here and I go, okay, there's my CH2, right? I'm a, none of my atoms are going to change. CH, that double bond is real far off from that resonance business, so nothing's going to happen there. CH down. Okay, and that's a really wonky ring, but we're not going to judge. And then I'm going to say, okay, now I got my, I'm just, now I'm just going to draw in my atoms because I know my atoms aren't going to change, right? Okay. And so then what I do is I say, okay, look, these electrons are going to move. When we look at this, right, these electrons are going to move and they're going to go right here. They're going to move towards that feature. They're going to move towards that triple bond. And those electrons now are going to flop up right there. And so what we have then is what you do is you look and you use your arrows. Those electrons form a double bond. Great. Put that double bond in here. Though the second arrow shows a triple bond going, and so those electrons go away, so you're left with a double bond. And now we have electrons sitting on that carbon. So now it's the time to head to that third thing and say, what happens to those formal charges, right? Well, this guy is going to become more positive by one because the electrons, we don't have any lone pair of electrons again. And then this one is going to become more negative by one because we now have two electrons on it. This takes practice. So don't be frustrated, but do practice this. Now, I'm going to review um, the next two sections, kind of review some shorthand notation. And so I want to hit that. We did that a little bit in Gen Chem, but we're just going to review it. So when we look at um, shorthand notations, notice that lone pairs are frequently emitted. So you need to be really careful. Sometimes you'll have to put the lone pairs in. That's why we practice that in this chapter. Um, and so we know drawing these detailed Lewis structures can be tedious. And so, for example, for this molecule, we're going to use the condensed structure where this carbon here, we've got one, two, three hydrogens. And so it shows CH3, but we know that this carbon and this carbon are attached by a single bond. And then this carbon and this carbon are also attached by a single bond. So we know those carbons are attached to each other, but the hydrogens still follow here. So that's a condensed formula of propane. Now, lone pairs are frequently gonna be admitted from these Lewis structures. They're not gonna be shown. And so because lone pairs have these really vital roles in organic reaction, you are going to be you are going to need to be able to put them back in as necessary. Um, and so knowing where lone pairs belong really requires an understanding of how formal charge relates to the number of bonds and lone pairs on various atoms. This is table 1.5 from your book and it illustrates formal charges in a lot of different bonding arrangements. I want you to notice that the atoms have octets in all scenarios that are shown with the exception of carbon, where it says no octet there. So I want you to look at this. If you have a carbon with a negative charge, it's got three bonds and two lone pairs. No charge, it has four bonds. If it just has three bonds, it's got a positive charge and no octet, and that's the only example there. Nitrogen, if it has two lone pairs, it has a negative. I, I cannot express how imperative it is for you to memorize this. We are going to use this all the way through the rest of the course. They will show you a nitrogen. They'll put a negative there, and you have to recognize there are two lone pairs. It's super imperative. If there's no charge on nitrogen, it's got three bonds and one lone pair. If nitrogen has four charges, four bonds, it's going to have a positive charge. If you just have an oxygen, it's got a negative charge. It has six lone pairs. If you have an oxygen with two bonds and two lone pairs, it will not have a formal charge. If you have an oxygen with three bonds and two lone pairs, it has a plus one charge. With your halogens, we're, we might see this once. We're mostly going to see halogens with one bond and six lone pairs, 
or halogens with no bond and a negative charge. And we need to know those have eight lone pairs. So really work on committing this to memory and, and really keeping it because we'll use it over and over and over again. Now, let's look back at some of these condensed formulas. So, for example, um, we have uh, some condensed formulas here. Um, I want you to notice that each non-hydrogen atom is written explicitly, followed immediately by the number of hydrogen atoms that are bonded to it, right? So we have this, this carbon, and then hydrogen comes, comes here next. Um, I want you to notice that this is shown as a branch. And so I'm going to circle this in red here. This corresponds to that CH3. If you see parentheses like that, it means that it's a branch off of that carbon right there. Okay. And so I'm going to draw an arrow to it. What you're going to notice here, and we have to be really careful, is notice that this is a carboxylic acid functional group. We'll get into that more. And it's shown as a CO2H. These can also be shown as CH3COOH, right? Or shown as CH3C double bond OOH. These are like synonyms. So you have to watch that. Now, if you recognize bonding patterns, um, you can um, look at something like this and convert it into a skeletal tool pattern like that, right? So, and we're going to practice that, that a little bit. And we're going to practice this more in class too. And practice is just really going to help you with this. So, let's practice. Let's draw the Lewis structure for crotonaldehyde, which is shown here. Um, and so, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, which non-hydrogen atoms are bonded together? And so I'm gonna look here and I'm gonna say, okay, look, I got, and this is this is how I do it. I draw out my carbons. One, two, three, four. Oh, there are only four, and then the oxygen right there. Okay. Notice I leave quite a bit of space because I know I'm gonna have to draw in some hydrogens. Okay. So how many hydrogen atoms are bonded to need each non-hydrogen atom? So now we can come in and we can draw on our hydrogens. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go, okay, great. There's one, two, three. Okay, there's one here. There's one here. There's one here. And then the oxygen there. Now, you could obviously do, do that through, from the first one. I'm just showing you step by step. Then the next thing we say is, look, we need to add bonds and lone pairs to maximize the number of octets and make sure the total charge here is zero. We can't add any more atoms, but we can add in double bonds. So when I look and evaluate this, and I'm just gonna do this in another color, I'll choose blue, right? I look at this first carbon and I say, okay, that sucker has a full octet, two, four, six, eight. It's happy, doesn't need anything, I'm gonna move on. Now I come to this carbon, I go, oh snap, look, one, two, three. It doesn't have a full octet and there's no charge. And this one doesn't have a full octet and there's no charge. If I draw a double bond here, that will give all of those atoms access to a full octet. So both of that makes both of those carbons happy. So now I come over to this carbon and this oxygen and I say, okay, hey, look, I know oxygen, if it's uncharged, needs to have two bonds and two lone pairs. And this guy only has one bond. So I can come in and draw in this and then put those electrons in. That's why memorizing patterns is so important because you're going to continue to use it over and over again. Now, chemists in our heart are lazy and, and we can draw things out when you have a condensed structure. But what you're going to see more often are line structures. And so here are some line structures. Um, in line structures, carbon atoms aren't drawn explicitly. Um, they're implied at the intersection of every two or more lines. So they're, they're implied here. And at the end of every bond that's drawn. So there and there. Um, all non-carbon atoms and non-hydrogen atoms are called heteroatoms. Okay. So all non-carbon and 
non-hydrogen atoms are heteroatoms, right? And so hydrogen atoms bonded to carbon atoms aren't, aren't going to be drawn, right? And hydrogen atoms bonded to all other atoms are drawn. So notice, we're not going to draw any hydrogens here that are bonded to carbon, but once we have this heteroatom here, this nitrogen, then we're going to draw in those hydrogens, right? Um, several carbon atoms bonded in a single chain are represented by this zigzag structure, and lone pairs of electrons are generally not shown. So we're not showing the lone pairs of electrons here, okay? Now, they can be drawn in to emphasize the important aspect of an atom, okay? And so those are some things that we can see. I want us to do one more example. Um, so this example is, why is it incorrect to draw resonant structures for propene shown here? Okay, so basically, why is this wrong? Why is what we're showing here wrong? And the first thing we need to evaluate here when it's wrong is it says, does the first structure have any of the five features? No, there are no five features. Look, there are no, no octets that are lacking. There are no lone pairs. Um, nothing there is, is weird, okay, um, or unusual. So the next thing is that if you can't evaluate that right off the bat, what would the initial structure look like as a complete Lewis structure? And so with all the hydrogen atoms drawn in. So when I look at this, I say, okay, I'm going to come here and say, draw this from the stick structure, and I'm going to draw in all of these atoms, right? And this is what the molecule looks like. And then I'm going to say, look, if I do what this arrow tells me, if I put those over here, what is that resonance structure going to look like? Carbon, hydrogen, 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 double bond, carbon, single bond, carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. And that's going to have a plus and that's going to have a negative. Here's the deal. This right here is a, is a big no. And here's why. If there's a big rule that's broken here. Carbon, right, is a second row element. And these guys cannot have expanded octets. Carbon can only have eight electrons around it because of the, because it, it only has... 1s, it only goes up to 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. It only has access in, in the p's there. So it only really has space in its valence electrons for eight electrons, right? So we are never, ever going to see an expanded octet. So that's why you cannot draw a resonance structure for propene. There's none of the features there.